In this presentation, we are going to take a look at the chapters in Alma, chapters 17 through 22. And let's consider some of the doctrines and principles that are taught in these chapters that will help us to return unto Christ. So, let's begin with chapter Alma, chapter 17. 17 verse 2, the phrase Alma did rejoice exceedingly to see his brethren. There is a love of brotherhood or sisterhood, a bond shared by those who labor in the Lord's service that surpasses all other feelings of camaraderie. Such are the emotions experienced in this unexpected missionary union. Alma and the sons of Mosiah parted company 14 years before with little to offer the Lord but willing hearts and youthful exuberance. They now met as men of seasoned faith, men of sound understanding, an understanding that comes only by an earnest desire for the word of the Lord, coupled with faithful service in his name. Elder L. Tom Perry, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, shared a personal example of meeting his first missionary companion after several years had passed. Quote, I had an experience a few years ago of receiving a call from my son Lee. He told me that my first missionary companion was in his neighborhood, and he wanted to spend a few minutes with me. We had a special experience of being together after many years of not seeing one another. As missionaries, we were given the opportunity of opening up a new town in Ohio to missionary work. Because of this assignment, we were allowed to labor together for 10 months. He was my trainer, my first companion. It was difficult for me to keep up with him, but as we served together, we drew close together as companions. Our companionship did not end with the 10-month assignment. World War II was raging, and when I returned home, I had only a short time to adjust before I was drafted into military service. On my first Sunday in boot camp, I attended an LDS service. I saw the back of a head that was very familiar to me. It was my first missionary companion. We spent, all, we spent most of the next two and a half years together. Although circumstances were very difficult for us in military service, we tried to continue the practices of missionary service. As often as we could, we prayed together. When circumstances allowed, we had scripture study together. We were both set apart as group leaders, and we again had the opportunity to serve and teach together the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior. We were more successful in military than we had been as full-time missionaries. Why? because we were experienced, returned missionaries. My visit with my first compa missionary companion was the last opportunity I had to be with him. He was suffering from an incurable disease and died only a few months later. It was a wonderful experience to relive our missions together and then tell about our lives following our missionary service. We recounted our service in bishoprics, high councils, and state presidencies, and of course we bragged about our children and our grandchildren. As we sat and thrilled at the opportunity of being together, I couldn't help but think of the account in the 17th chapter of the book of Alma. End of quote. Chapter 17, verse 12, 2, the phrase, The angel first appeared unto him. It will be remembered that Alma and sons of Mosiah were rebellious in their youth and went about seeking to destroy the church. As they were doing so, an angel of the Lord appeared, warning them that their efforts to destroy the church would lead to their own destruction. The reference here to the angel first appearing to Alma suggests another visit or visits by the same angel. Indeed, this was the case why Alma the missionary lamented over the wickedness of the people Ammonihah. The same angel appeared to console him and to commend him for his faithful labors. Chapter 17, verse 2, the phrase, men of sound understanding, meant these had walked strong in the knowledge of the truth. They were possessed of that knowledge, that understanding, that wisdom which is given from above. Though they had searched the scriptures diligently, the grasp of principles of saving verities had come through revelation, through divine teaching. Chapter 12, verse 2, the phrase, they searched the scriptures diligently. The sons of Mosiah searched the scriptures as an essential part of their missionary preparation. Likewise, Hiram Smith received counsel from the Lord to prepare for his missionary serve 
service by first seeking to obtain his word. The missionary handbook, Preach My Gospel, emphasizes the importance of seeking the Holy Ghost, having a strong desire to learn, and putting what we learn into action as key components of effective gospel study. It says, quote, Your gospel study is most effective when you are taught by the Holy Ghost. Always begin your gospel study by praying for the Holy Ghost to help you learn. He will bring knowledge and conviction that will bless your life and allow you to bless the lives of others. Your faith in Jesus Christ will increase. Your desire to repent and improve will grow. This kind of study prepares you for service, offers solace, resolves problems, and gives you the strength to endure to the end. Successful gospel study requires desire and action. For he that diligently seeks shall find, and the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto him by the power of the Holy Ghost, as well as in times of old. 1 Nephi 10.19 Like Enos, as you hunger to know the words of eternal life, and as you allow these words to sink deep into your heart, Enos 1.3, the Holy Ghost will open your mind and heart to greater light and understanding. Learning the gospel is also a process of receiving revelation. End of quote from the handbook. In addition, Preach My Gospel recommends the use of a scripture journal as one way to increase the power of your scripture study. By recording your thoughts and impressions while studying the, your scriptures, you open new avenues of personal revelation. It says, quote, a study journal can help you understand, clarify, and remember what you are learning. Elder Richard G. Scott taught that knowledge carefully recorded is knowledge available in time of need. Spiritually sensitive information should be kept in a sacred place that communicates to the Lord how you treasure it. This practice enhances the likelihood of you receiving further light. End of quote. Review your study journal to recall spiritual experiences, see new insights, and recognize your growth. Your study journal may be a bound journal, a notebook, or a binder. Record and organize your thoughts and impressions in a way that fits how you learn. Develop your own system to easily access key information in the fuser. Use it often to review access and apply what you have learned. Use your study journal to take notes and record impressions. Chapter 17, verse 3, the phrase, They had given themselves to much prayer and fasting. Their pleadings were earnest. Their requests to God were sincere. They demonstrated this through fasting. Fasting is a principle of power. As one fasts and as the body grows weaker, one becomes even more aware of the need for physical and spiritual sustenance for those things which both strengthen the body and enliven the soul. Fasting leads to a consciousness of victory over self, victory over the flesh, victory over the appetites, and thus to that quiet confidence which we know as spirituality. L. M. Russell Ballard, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, illustrated the power of fasting in prayer and prayer in the Lord's service with the following story, quote, Some years ago, a faithful convert, Brother George McLaughlin, was called to preside over a small branch of 20 members in Farmingdale, Maine. He was a humble man who drove a milk delivery truck for a living. Through his fasting and earnest prayers, the Spirit taught him what he and the members of his branch needed to do to help the church to grow in the area. Through his great faith, constant prayer, and powerful example, he taught his members how to share the gospel. It's a marvelous story, one of the great missionary stories of this dispensation. In just one year, there were 450 convert baptisms in the branch. The next year, there were an additional 200 converts. End of quote. Chapter 17, verse 3, the phrase, the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of revelation means, all saving truths are manifest and must be learned by the spirit of revelation. In turn, they are to be taught by the spirit of prophecy. In many ways, the spirit of revelation is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of revelation is that spirit which manifests things to the hearts and souls of men. It is a spirit that enlightens the mind of both the spokesman and the listener. It is the spirit by which all gospel truths must be learned. 
when the teacher or preacher of the word so attunes himself with the Spirit of the Lord that what he says and does is what the Lord would say and do in the same circumstance, he has obtained the spirit of revelation and of prophecy. Most generally, the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of, fo of uh, that should be the spirit of faith. Sorry. Didn't quite catch that. Spirit of faith telling rather than the spirit of foretelling. It is by the spirit of prophecy that the scriptures are properly interpreted and appropriately applied in a given situation. To have the spirit of prophecy is to preach by the power of the Holy Ghost. It is to speak with the tongues of angels, to speak the words of Christ, to declare the mind, will, voice, and word of the Lord. The manifestation of future events may be associated with spirit, with either spirit, but the unfolding of the past is generally associated with the spirit of revelation. I'm sorry, that was right in the first case. Most generally, the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of foretelling. rather than the spirit of foretelling. Alma 17, verse 3, they taught with power and authority. I call upon the weak things of the word, world, the Lord declared, those who are unlearned and despised, to thrash the nations by the power of my spirit, DNC 3513. For the gospel comes not, quote, in word, word only, as Paul testified, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, 1 Thessalonians 1.5. Those called to teach the word of God are to declare faithfully the commandments and the revelations, doing so with power and authority, DNC 28.3. They are to diminish not a word, Jeremiah 26.2, neither adding to nor taking from the heaven-sent message. Thus, when the messenger has been properly called and prepared, the Lord's promise is, you shall have my spirit and my word, yea, the power of God under the convincing of men. DNC 11, 21. Chapter 17, verse 4, the phrase, Many were brought before the altar of God. The altar was a place of prayer and confession to God, a place of sacrifice, a place of covenant, a place of the divine presence. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, the Lord told Israel in the days of Moses, and thou shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, I will bless thee. Chapter 17, verse 5, the phrase, They did suffer much, both in body and in mind, such as hunger, thirst, and fatigue, and also labor, much labor in the spirit. Spiritual strength and stability is not the child of ease. The soul that has bone, borne no burdens knows no strength. Chapter 17, verse 9, the phrase, Prayer and fasted for those without the truth. President Gordon B. Hinckley counseled every member to work and pray for missionary opportunities, quote, that there be cultivated an awareness in every member's heart of his own potential for bringing others to a knowledge of the truth. Let him work at it. Let him pray with great earnestness about it. End of quote. Elder Russ M. Russell Ballard admonished us to pray for guidance in doing the Lord's work, quote, the gospel sharing home, in gospel sharing homes, we pray for guidance for ourselves, and we pray for the physical and spiritual well-being of others. We pray for the people the missionaries are teaching, for our acquaintances, and for those not of our faith. In the gospel sharing homes of Alma's time, the people were joined in fasting a mighty prayer on behalf of the welfare, welfare of the souls of those who knew not God. End of quote. Chapter 17, verse 9, the phrase, an instrument in the hands of God. 
At the conference in which he was sustained as the 10th president of the church, President Joseph Fielding Smith said, quote, I desire to say that no man of himself can lead this church. It is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is at the head. The church bears his name, has his priesthood, administers his gospel, preaches his doctrine, and does his work. He chooses men and calls them to be instruments in his hands to accomplish his purposes, and he guides and directs them in their labors. But men are only instruments in the Lord's hands, and the honor and glory for all that his servants accomplish is and should be ascribed unto him, that is Christ and the Father, forever. If this were the work of man, it would fail, but it is the work of the Lord, and it, he does not fail. And we have the assurance that if we keep the commandments and are valiant in the testimony of Jesus and are true to every trust, the Lord will guide and direct us and his church in the paths of righteousness for the accomplishment of all his purposes. End of quote. Chapter 17, verse 9, the phrase traditions which were not correct. Righteous traditions are the sanctuary of memory. They preserve purpose and meaning. They protect the sacred and virtuous. They hollow strength, courage, and honor. They bind generation in a common cause. They have been a source of inspiration and direction to countless souls. By contrast, evil and false traditions have filled the world with confusion, have become a very mainspring of all corruptions, causing the earth to groan under the weight of their iniquity. They are an iron yoke, a strong band, the very handcuffs and chains and shackles and fetters of hell. They are a system whereby depravity, corruption, and darkness of all forms are and have been passed from generation to generation. False traditions bind, blind the eyes and minds of otherwise good and well-intentioned people. It may be that more people have rejected the restored gospel or, having accepted it, have subsequently refused the counsel of living prophets because of the effects of false traditions than for any other reason. Chapter 17, verse 11, the phrase, show forth good examples. Ammon and his brethren learned to live in peace with the Lamanites before they were able to share the gospel with them. Elder M. Russell Ballard suggests three important things we can do to, better, to be better neighbors to those not of our faith. Quote, first, get to know your neighbors. Learn about their families, their work, their views. Get together with them if they are willing, and do so without being pushy and without any ulterior motives. Friendship should never be offered as a means to an end. It can and should be an end unto itself. Let us cultivate meaningful relationships of mutual trust and understanding with people from different backgrounds and beliefs. Second, I believe it would be good if we would eliminate a couple of phrases from our vocabulary, non-member and non-Mormon. Such phrases can be demeaning and even belittling. Personally, I don't consider myself a non-Catholic or a non-Jew. I am a Christian. I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That is how I prefer to be identified, for who and what I am, as opposed to being identified for what I am not. Let us extend that same courtesy to those who live among us. If a collective description is needed, then neighbors seems to work well in most cases. And third, if neighbors become testy or frustrated because of some disagreement with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint, or with some law we suppose for moral reasons, please don't suggest to them, even in a humorous way, that they consider moving someplace else. I cannot comprehend how any member of the Church can even think of such a thing. Our pioneer ancestors were driven from place to place by uninformed and intolerant neighbors. They experienced extraordinary hardship and persecution because they thought, acted, and believed differently from others. If our history teaches us nothing else, it should teach us to respect the rights of all people to peacefully coexist with one another. End of his quote. Elder L. Tom Perry illustrated how 
our example can lead others to draw near unto the Lord. Quote, a 19-year-old missionary would never forget his first day in the mission field, for this taught him a great lesson about using his talents to teach the gospel. He and his senior companion were assigned to open a new city some distance from the missionary headquarters. As they arrived in this new city, they walked down the street. They passed a church with a minister standing at, standing at the front door. As they walked by the church, the minister went in and called to his whole congregation to follow him out into the street. There they followed the missionaries and started calling them names. Then they became more violent and started to throw rocks at them. The younger elder was excited about this experience, his first day in the mission field, and already he was being stoned, he thought. Then a big rock suddenly hit him squarely in the middle of the back, and his feeling changed to anger. Before entering the mission field, he had been quite a baseball pitcher, and in the flush of anger, he wheeled around, grabbed the first rock he could find on the ground, reared back in his famous pitching prose, and was just ready to let the rock fly at the crowd, when suddenly he realized why he was there. He had not been sent all that way to Brazil to throw rocks at people. He was there to teach them the gospel. But what was he to do with the rock in his hand? If he dropped it to the ground, they would think it a sign of weakness and probably continue to throw rocks at them. Yet he could not throw it at the crowd. Then he saw a telephone post some distance away. That was the way he saved face. He reared back and let the rock fly directly at the post, hitting it squarely in the middle. The people in the crowd took a couple of steps back. They suddenly realized that the rock probably could have hit any one of them right between the eyes. Their mood changed. Instead of throwing rocks at the missionaries, they began throwing them at the telephone post. After this instance, every time the elder went down the street, he was challenged to a rock-throwing contest. The rock-throwing contest led to discussions of the gospel, which led to conversations, which led to the establishment of a branch of the church in that community, end of quote. Chapter 17, verse 11, the phrase, yet ye shall be patient. The charge to the missionaries is to establish the word of the Lord among the Lamanites. Salvation will come to these, their wayward brothers, only by compliance with the same principles by which it had come to the Nephites. There is but one standard, and all must rise to it. Nevertheless, the Lord is more patient with some than with others. The standard will not and cannot change, but because of their spiritual and provish condition, the Lord will allow the Lamanites more time to grow up to the standard. The missionaries must learn patience and long-suffering with their contacts and must bear persecution and hardship in that same spirit. Chapter 17, verse 14, the phrase they had undertaken to preach the word of God to a wild and a hardened and ferocious people. The Lamanites throughout many generations of indolence and its many evil ways had grown further and further away from the worship of the true and living God, whom their first fathers had known in ancient Jerusalem. Some of them even worshipped idols and became of their wickedness and lonesomeness. God had cursed them to make them undesirable as helpmeets for the Nephite men and women. However, the kingdom of God was not beyond the reach of the Lamanites if they repented of their evil ways. Salvation was for all God's children. It was for this reason that the missionaries risked their lives and all the worldly things they held dear to declare to the darkened Lamanites the love of God and the many precious gifts that awaited them if only they would forsake the traditions of their fathers and return to God who giveth to all men liberally. Chapter six, 17, verse 16, the phrase, the plan of redemption. This is the very plan announced by the Father and the Grand Council of Heaven. It is the plan embraced by the Savior when he said, Father, thy will be done. The plan sustained by those who kept their first estate, the plan fought against by Lucifer and his minions, and opposed by all those who advocated salvation based upon doctrines or teachings foreign to the plan of righteousness. Chapter 17, verses 19 through 39 
Ammon went to the land of Ishmael. This is one of the often told and loved stories of the Book of Mormon. It is a vivid dramatization of the attributes needed to be a successful missionary or servant of the Lord. In it, Ammon becomes a Messiah figure. Humble servant, good shepherd, hope to the distraught, protector and defender of the king's flock. Those who scatter the king's sheep are properly rewarded. Those who raise their arms with the sword in hand have them cut off. Alma, Ammon, whose power was heaven sent, sought no honor for himself, just as the Savior gave all glory and honor to the Father, save it were that of teaching the doctrines of his Father to King Lamoni and his people. Chapter 17, verses 22 through 23. Here we see one of the primary characteristics of a successful missionary, a love of the people and a love of the land in which the missionaries serve. For all we know, Alma may have left behind wife and children, at least friends and acquaintances. He left the comfort and peace and predictability of the known for a new life, 14 years, life among the unknown, among a people who had been enemies to the Nephites for generations. But Ammon was focused, dedicated, his eyes single to the glory of God. He had put his hand to the plow and had no inclination to look back. He had been born of the Spirit, and in that condition he was desirous that salvation should be declared to every creature, for he could not bear that any human soul should perish, yea, even the very thoughts that any soul should endure endless torment did cause him to quake and tremble. Chapter 17, verse 25, the phrase, I will be thy servant, the ambassador of the Lord are called upon to do that which their master does love and serve. Selfless service sanctifies both giver and receiver. As the Savior taught, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Chapter 17, verse 28. The phrase, now the king will slay us. Lamoni, or some of his predecessors, had established a somewhat unique criminal code which regarded to regard with regarding with regard to stealing the royal cattle. They had adopted the idea that it was easier and cheaper to make the herdsmen responsible for the loss and punish them, therefore, than to hunt out and capture the thieves. It had at least one virtue. It prevented collusion between the servants, but it produced much dissatisfaction among Lamoni's subjects. Chapter 17, verse 29, the phrase, I will show forth my power unto these my fellow servants, or the power which is in me. The servants of the Lord pray and petition the heavens for teaching moments, for those special occasions when the power and goodness of God in his word can be manifest. The spirit of readiness and receptive, res, receptive, receptivity must be had by those outside the faith before the message of truth can be delivered and accepted. Chapter 17, verse 37, He smote off their arms with his sword. This detail of the narrative may be read in connection with Deuteronomy 33.20. In this verse and the following verses, Moses prophesied concerning the tribe of Gad, among other things. It says, He dwelleth as a lion and teareth the arm with the crown of his head. That means, according to Hebrew commentators, that the warriors of that tribe had learned to disarm and kill an antagonist by smiting the crown of his head and his arm with one stroke, or one movement of the sword's blade. Perhaps this is where Ammon learned about this type of warfare, was from Deuteronomy and Moses. Ammon seems to have learned this manner of swords play, in which the warriors of Gad excelled, and which inspired Moses to compare that tribe to a lion having its lair in the wilderness. And as the psalmist says, quote, For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. Psalms 37, 17. Let's now turn our attention to Alma chapter 18. 18, chapter 18, verses 1 through 24, service softens hearts. 
Knowing that he would have had no chance to receive a respectful hearing from Lenormai when he first came into the land, Ammon had agreed to be his servant. This pleased the king and created the opportunity for Ammon to manifest the power of his God in defense of Lenormai's shepherds and flocks. The miracle of strength and power of protection granted him Create, granted him, created the opportunity for him to teach King Lomoni the gospel. This is similar to the power followed by Christ in his ministry. He too came as the humble servant, performing miracles to bless the common people and create the opportunity to be heard by them. President Henry B. Iron of the First President explained how temporary Temporal service can soften a heart and lead to a miracle. Quote, when the other servants brought the evidence of what Ammon had done, King Lamoni said, Where is he? They said, Oh, he is in the stables. He is doing every little thing to serve you. Isn't that odd? He was called to teach the gospel of salvation, but he was in the stables. Don't you think he should have been praying and fasting and polishing his teaching plan? No, he was in the stables. King Lomoni had been brought up with a belief that there was a God, but that whatever the king did was right. He had been specifically taught false doctrine that might have made him imperv impervious to feelings of guilt. Do you remember that when he heard when Ammon, where Ammon was, a feeling of guilt, of fear that he had done wrong and killing his servants came over him? I have always focused before on how mixed up Lamoni was in his doctrine without seeing the miracle. The miracle was that a spiritual need was created in a man that he might be taught the gospel of Jesus Christ. His heart was broken. He felt guilt. And it came from the temporal things that Ammon had done. Never, never underestimate the spiritual value of doing temporal things well for those whom you serve. Be their servants, and you will love them, and they will feel your love, and more important, they will feel God's love. End of quote. Chapter 18, verse 13, the word Rabana. Rabban, Rabana. It is a wonderful word. Translated, it means powerful or great king. In applying that name to Ammon, the servants of Lomoni did not know that in reality he was a prince, the son of the mighty king of the, ne the Nephites. But after Ammon's miraculous exploits at the waters of Sebus, they regarded him as did their master something more than a man. Whether Rabana is a Nephite or a Lamanite word is uncertain, as the Lamanites of that period, 91 BC, have been taught by royal command in the language of the Nephites. It is, however, of little moment to which of these kindred tongues it belongs, but its Hebrew derivation is most unmistakable. Its original is inevitably Abba, Father. Max Muller, the great authority on such points, says that the word king originally meant father, having doubtlessly taken this form in the earliest patriarchal days when the kings ruled by the right of their fatherhood and represented God, the great father of us all. This ancient word confirms Professor Muller's statement. At the same time, it manifests how remarkable the unities of the Book of Mormon are preserved, consistent with only with its claims to divine inspiration. It would be the height of folly to ascribe such a coincidence to chance. A man must be far more credulous so to believe that it can be possibly claimed those who are placed implicit confidence in the realities of Nephite and Lamanite history. In other words, that Joseph Smith got this word correct and of its Hebrew origins is against all odds. This was translated by divine authority. Chapter 18, verse 16, the phrase Ammon could discern their thoughts. In the ultimate sense, only God knows the thoughts and intents of the hearts of men. On occasions, however, he does grant to his chosen servants the discerning and revelatory powers needed to know the motives and dispositions of those they teach or confront. Ammon, living near unto God, was filled with his spirit and discerned it by what were the thoughts in the king's heart. Chapter 18, verses 19 to 20, the phrase, I am not. Ammon's answer to the question, propounded by the king, did not satisfy Lamoni's yearnings. In spite of Ammon's assurance, he still wondered how Ammon knew all his thoughts. 
Perhaps Ammon hesitated somewhat in speaking to the king of his powers with the sling and the sword. He did not wish to be thought bragging, and for Ammon to boast to the king of his skill in using them was furthermost from Ammon's desire. The king, seeing that Ammon, Ammon fault, faltered in his speech, bade him speak boldly. Tell me by what power ye slew and smote off the arms of my brethren that scattered my flocks. Chapter 18, verse 21. If thou wilt tell me concerning these things, whatsoever thou desirest, I will give unto thee. The king was now setting himself free from the mental disturbances that but a short time before had undone the, server, the severe mode of his life. Until Ammon came in upon the scene, Lamoni commanded, where now, where now he begged, the king now offered what before time he took. He wanted to buy, much as we do common merchandise, the power that rested in Ammon. The king offered to give him anything he desired if only Ammon could disclose to the king the hidden source of his overwhelming strength. All the king's servants, even his armies to guard him, were promised Ammon for complying with the king's request. Lamoni wanted that same power. Chapter 18, verse 23, he was caught with guile. Yea, I will believe all thy words, is the answer Lamoni gave to Ammon's well-thought-out question. Guile means deceitful cunning, craft, and treachery, a stratagem, a trick. An old usage of the word is to beguile. Thus, Ammon's questions and inquiry were all a part of his plan or strategy. So in this case, Ammon is using guile to mean strategy, not to tr trick or be deceitful. But this was a part of his strategy. Chapter 18, verse 24, Ammon began to speak unto him with boldness. Those who teach by the power of the Holy Ghost teach with boldness, or as Apostle Paul stated, with much assurances. Timidity or uncertainty are not companions of the Spirit. The servants of the Lord are taught to speak forth the words of truth with boldness without being overbearing. Many members of the church feel concerned about how to begin gospel conversations. Ammon's approach was to ask Lamoni questions about his belief in God. Others have found it natural to simply talk about their church life with their friends. Elder M. Russell Ballard gave valuable counsel about starting gospel conversations with our friends. He said, quote, Creating a gospel-sharing home does not mean that we are going to have to dedicate large amounts of time to meeting and cultivating friends with whom to share the gospel. These friends will come naturally into our lives, and if we are open about our membership in the church from the very beginning, we can easily bring gospel discussions into the relationship with very little risk of being misunderstood. Friends and acquaintances will accept this as this is part of who we are, and they will feel free to ask questions. A sister in France was asked about the secret of her success. She said, I simply share my joy. I treat, everyone, I treat everyone as if they were already a member of the church. If I am standing by someone in line and strike up a conversation, I share with them how much I enjoyed my church meetings on Sunday. When co-workers ask, what did you do this weekend? I do not skip from Saturday night to Monday morning. I share with them that I went to church, what was said, and my experience with the saints. I talk about how I live, think, and feel. End of quote. Chapter 18, verses 24 through 35, the phrase, Believest thou that there is a God building on common beliefs? Alma began teaching the Moni with beliefs they had in common. While serving as a missionary of the sev a member of the 70, Ella Lauren C. Dunn spoke on the importance of showing respect for others' beliefs and building on common ground. Quote, Today we live in times of conflict, dissent, differences of opinion, charges, countercharges, disagreements. There is a need for us, perhaps more than ever before, to reach within ourselves and allow the quality of mutual respect, mingled with charity and forgiveness, to influence our actions with one another, to be able to disagree without becoming disagreeable, to lower our voices and build on common ground with the realization that once the storm has passed, we will still have to live with one another. End of quote. The first question Ammon asked when he began to teach King Lamoni was, Believest thou there is a God? When Ammon learned that 
Lamoni believed in a great spirit, he testified, this is God. Technically, God is not a great spirit, but Ammon looked beyond that and focused instead on their common belief in a supreme being and taught from that point. Ammon took Lamoni's fundamental belief in a creator and added eternal truths that would light up his mind. Some have been critical of Ammon's response to Lamoni, knowing that God is a corporal being and thus more than just a great spirit. In fact, Ammon's statement is technically correct. The God of the Old Testament was Jehovah, who had not as yet obtained a body of flesh and bones. President Gordon B. Hinckley explained how we should also build on the good that others already possess. Quote, we say in a spirit of love, bring with you all that you have of good and truth, which you have received from whatever source, and come and let us see if we may add to it. This invitation I extend to men, I extend to men and women everywhere. Chapter 18, verse 32, the phrase, he knows all the thoughts and intents of our heart. If God were unable to read the thoughts and the desires of our hearts, he would also be unable to judge our actions. The very nation, nature of Godhood requires that he has a perfect knowledge of our thoughts and the intents of our hearts. The assurance of the scriptures is that the judgments of God will combine works and desires as one. Chapter 18, verse 34, the phrase, just and true. That which is just is that which is right. Thus the justified are those who have done that which is right and proper in the eyes of God, or whose lives have been made right through the med mediation of a greater power. That which is true is that which is faithful or trustworthy. To be brought to a knowledge of that which is just and true is to come to that knowledge which marks a straight course, one which can be followed with full confidence and trust. Chapter 18, verse 35, the phrase, which giveth me knowledge. The Spirit is and must be the source of that knowledge, which is eternal, since the Comforter knoweth all things. All true religion is revealed religion. Chapter 18, verses 36 through 39, the phrase, he began at the creation of the world and also the creation of Adam, teaching the plan of salvation. What do you teach a person who has no knowledge of God or the gospel and yet has consented to listen and believe? Where do you start? What principles do you emphasize? The way in which Ammon taught King Lamoni constitutes a classic response to such questions. Ammon taught him what we have come to know as the three pillars of eternity, the creation, the fall, and the atonement. These three doctrines, which are inseparably associated one with another, constitute the foundation upon which all other gospel principles must rest. Indeed, any principle that cannot comfortably rest on the foundation of these doctrines or be tied to it has no place in the teachings in the kingdom, in God's kingdom. To testify that Jesus of Nazareth is our Savior raises the question, particularly to one such as Lamoni, from what do we need to be saved? The answer, of course, is the fall of Adam. This, in turn, raises the question, from what did Adam fall? The answer is the paradisiacal state in which all things were originally created. Thus, the creation becomes parent to the fall, and the fall parent to the atonement. Ammon began his instructions to Lomoni as the scriptures begin their instructions to all of us, that is, by rehearsing the story of the creation in order that the Lamanite king might know the power of God and know that God is the creator of all things both in heaven and on earth. Ammon recounted the story of Adam's creation with the testimony that the first of all men was made in the image and likeness of God his father. Then, and all this in order and pattern of the scriptures, Ammon unfolded the doctrine of the fall. The story of how Adam and Eve introduced corruption and death in their previously paradisiacal state so that they might fill the measure of their creation, having posterity and becoming subject to death. Adam fell, Lehi said, that men might be, and men are they might have joy. The fall in turn created the need for a redeemer, one who could free Adam and Eve and all their posterity from the effects of their fallen state and, 
and make it possible for them to return to that God who gave them life. Let's try that again. Adam, Adam, Eve, and all their posterity from the effects of their fallen state make it impossible for them to return to the God who gave them life. That should be impossible. Sorry about that. Thus, God created Adam, and by Adam came the fall of man, and because the fall of man came Jesus Christ, even the Father and the Son. And because of Jesus Christ came the redemption of man. Such Ammon testified was the plan of redemption, which was prepared from the foundation of the world. Elder Russell M. Nelson, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained how each component of the plan is essential. Quote, the plan required the creation, and that in turn required both the fall and the atonement. These are the three fundamentals, components of the plan. The creation of a paradisiacal planet came from God. Mortality and death came into the world through the fall of Adam. Immortality and the possibility of eternal life were provided by the atonement of Jesus Christ. The creation, the fall, and the atonement were planned long before the actual work of the creation began. In fact, this is what we were taught before we ever came here in the Grand Councils of Heaven. Chapter 18, verses 41 through 43, and then chapter 22, 15 through 18. The phrase, he began to cry unto the Lord, saying, and then this has to do with our dependency on Christ. Ammon and Aaron helped Lamoni and his father understand how much they needed the plan of redemption in their lives. Understanding our dependency on Christ leads to conversion. Both Lamoni and his father became aware of their fallen nature and of their need for help. They come to know that their only hope for redemption was through the atonement of Christ that Christ had brought. Alma 18.42, the phrase, when he said this, he fell to the earth. Dr dramatic conversions are exceptions. President Ezra Taft Benson gave the following counsel concerning dramatic conversions. Quote, we must be careful as we seek to become more and more godlike that we do not become discouraged and lose hope. Becoming Christ-like is a lifetime pursuit and often involves growth and change that is slow and almost imperceptible. The scriptures record remarkable accounts of men whose life changed dramatically in an instant, as it were. Alma the Younger, Paul on the road to Damascus, Enos praying far into the night, King Lamoni, such astonishing examples of the power to change, even those steeped in sin, give confidence that the atonement can reach even those deepest in despair. But we must be cautious as we discuss these remarkable examples. Though they are real and powerful, they are the exception more than the rule. For every Paul, for every Enos, for every King Lamoni, there are hundreds and thousands of people who find the process of repentance much more subtle, much more imperceptible. Day by day, they move closer to the Lord, little realizing they are building a godlike faith. They live quiet lives of goodness, service, and commitment. They are like the Lamanites who the Lord said were baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost, and they knew it not. We now turn to Alma, chapter 19. Chapter 19, verses 1 through 17. Having heard of Ammon's message, Lamoni fell to the earth as if he were dead, in which state he remained for three days. His condition was so like death that his servants insisted that his body was in a state of decay, that it stank, and that it ought to be buried. The queen refused, believing her husband to still be alive. She sent for Ammon, having been told that he was a prophet of a holy God. He is not dead, Ammon assured her, but he sleepeth in God. And he said to her, and he said her husband would arise on the morrow, that being the third day. Lamoni came forth as promised, and as he did so, he praised God and testified that he had seen the Redeemer. He then prophesied that the Savior would be born of a woman and would redeem from all mankind those who should believe on his name. At this both point, he and the queen were 
or overpowered by the Spirit and fell into a trance together. In like manner, Ammon was also overpowered with joy, and thus all three had sunk to the earth, whereupon the servants of Lamoni, those who had previously been witnesses of Ammon's power, commenced praying in the name of the Lord, doing so with such power and faith that each of them in turn fell in a similar trance. Thus all in the court of the king had fallen into a trance, save one woman by the name of Abish, who had previously been converted. She commenced from going from house to house, telling the people of these marvelous things God had done. This remarkable story sheds considerable light on a number of biblical texts. In both the Old and New Testaments, we have instances in which the bodily functions of prophets were suspended as part of a revelatory experience. Indeed, such a state was recognized as a vehicle for receiving revelation. The first of these stories involves Balaam, who, falling into a trance, had his eyes open that he might see the vision of the Almighty. That's in Numbers 24, 4, 16. We read of Ezekiel being transported by the Spirit to Tel Abib, near the river Chabar, where he apparently remained in a trance for seven days. At the end of that period, the word of the Lord came unto him, Ezekiel 3, 14 through 17. The appropriate word to describe his statement seems most difficult to find. For instance, the King James Version renders it astonished. The New English Bible, dumbfounded, Jerusalem Bible, stunned, the Moffat, overwhelmed. The hand of the Lord falls on him, and he sees the visions of God. Here's the voice of the Almighty is lifted up between the earth and the heavens and passes from the river of Chabar to the Lord's house in Jerusalem. That's Ezekiel 8, 1 through 3. In the context of the New Testament, we read that Peter fell into a trance and saw the heaven open, whereupon the revelation of matchless importance was given, which extended the blessings of the gospel to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews. See Acts 10, 10 through 11. And it is significant that Paul, the great missionary of Gentiles, received his call to that labor in a similar state. While I prayed in the temple, he testified, I was in a trance and saw the Lord saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Acts 22, 7 and 21. Paul's writing suggests that he had other experiences of like nature. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord, he said. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. From what we can deduce from scriptural writ, it appears that a trance is a state in which the body and its functions become quiescent, meaning still, not moving, in order that the full powers of the Spirit may be centered on the revelations of heaven. Freed from the fetters of a mortal body, man's spirit can be ushered into the divine presence. It can hear what otherwise could not be heard, and see otherwise what could not be seen. Even the visions of eternity, and even the Almighty himself. Yet the trance, like all other spiritual experiences, is subject to counterfeiting. Such counterfeits were common, for instance, to the frontier camp meetings of the United States. The trance might be likened to another medium of revelation, namely that of the gift of tongues, which was also commonly mimicked at the camp meetings and many other settings. None would question tongues as a legitimate gift of heaven, and likewise there is no question that the gift of tongues has been and is often counterfeited. Though a trance is not sufficient proof of true religion, it certainly does not militate, meaning to oppose, against it, as the Bible, both Old and New Testament, and the Book of Mormon attest. It is of interest that the false prophets Shemaniah wrote to the priest Zephaniah, charging him to keep the temple a house of order by putting the mad prophets in prison and in stocks. His reference to mad prophets is understood to have been directed to those prophets who claimed authority through some ecstasy or trance. His purpose in doing so was to have the prophet Jeremiah imprisoned. 
it being well known that Jeremiah made claim to such experiences. The story of Ammon and Lamoni reaffirms religious trances as legitimate revelatory device. Lamoni, as already noted, came forth from his trance testifying that he had seen the Redeemer and had prophesied relative to the Savior's birth and the necessity of all mankind believing on his name. The testimony of his servants was that while they were in the state of physical insensibility, angels instructed them in the principles of salvation and their obligation to live righteously. Indeed, they experienced a change of heart and no longer had a desire to do evil. Such is the state in which the power of God overcame the natural frame and one is carried away in God. The test of the legitimacy of the religious trance, like that of tongues, is the efficacy of its purpose. Its genuineness must be ascertained by the same standard that determined the verity of revelation in all other forms. That is, by the asking of such questions as, does it teach faith in Christ, repentance, sacrifice, obedience to laws and ordinance of the gospel, and loyalty to the Lord's current and constituted church and his anointed servants? If a trance does not meet those requirements, then it is from a false source. Chapter 19, verse 6, the phrase, the, veil of, the dark veil of unbelief. This account of what King Lamoni experienced is an apt description of the conversion process, a process universal to all who choose the light of the gospel in preference to the darkness of unbelief so common to the world. Darkness and unbelief are inseparable companions. Thus, the saints of all ages have been commanded to learn the truth of the gospel. They might chase darkness from among them. Indeed, the world groaneth under sin and darkness. Even now, the Lord declared, and the latter-day saints, he said, your minds in times past have been darkened because of unbelief and because you have treated lightly the things you have received, having specific reference to the Book of Mormon and the other revelations of the Restoration. The phrase in verse 6, the light which did lighten up our minds, meant the term light and truth are used interchangeably in the Scripture. God is light. God is truth. Truth signs. Truth sanctifies. Truth abideth and hath no end. Light and truth forsaketh the evil, which is evil. The phrase infused such joy into his soul meant the message of salvation is aptly described as glad tidings of great joy. True principles properly understood always enlighten and lift. Chapter 19, verse 12, the phrase, Blessed be the name of God. To praise God is one thing. To praise the name of God is another. God's name is symbol of his essence, power, and authority. To praise his name is to do more than acknowledge the verity of his existence. It is to assert that salvation comes only in and through his holy name. It is to attest that no proper prayer can be offered, save it be offered in his name. It is to acknowledge that all gospel ordinances must be formed by the authority of his name. It is to profess that the gospel cannot be taught, save it is taught in his name. That miracles, healings, prophecies, indeed all things, must be properly done in the sacred name of Christ, if they are to be recognized and upheld in the heavens. Chapter 19, verses 23 through 24, the phrase, And now we see that Ammon could not be slain. Here Mormon, who was the abridger of this record, adds one of his frequent observations in explanation of data recorded. He now interpolates the information, evidently to impress us with the fact that the Lord's promise to Ammon, Ammon's father, King Mosiah, was not forgotten in the maze of quickly occurring events, and that because of that promise, Alma, Ammon could not be slain. That promise is again revealed to us in Mormon's reference to Mosiah's faith. It is within the power of God who gave us life to lengthen or shorten our sojourn in mortality. The righteous are not taken before their time, as the Lord revealed to the prophet to Joseph the seer, quote, Thy days are known, and thy years shall not be numbered less. Therefore, fear not what man can do, for God shall be with you forever and ever. DNC 122 9. Chapter 19, verses 25 through 26. It is obvious from this account that many perceive the doings and handiwork of God and understand his ways. Others are absolutely oblivious to what is divine and can neither recognize nor believe a heavenly manifestation. 
Chapter 19, verse 30, the phrase, speaking many words which were not understood, what meant. It would appear that the queen is speaking in tongues. It is difficult to tell whether she is preaching in the language of God, the Adamic language, or simply speaking with the tongue of angels, that is, speaking the words of Christ by the power of the Holy Ghost. Chapter 19, verse 32, the phrase, There were many who would not hear his words. As may be expected, there were some among them who did not believe in the words of the king and queen. The sacred record says of them, they went their way. There are always those who reject the counsel of God, relying upon their own strength. This, These sacred history shows are destroyed. Those who accept his word through thanksgiving and praise are benefited and blessed. Chapter 19, verse 33, the phrase, they had no more desire to do evil. Those whose hearts have been turned to God have their values turned to righteousness. After King Benjamin had delivered an inspired address, after his people had been converted, had experienced a mighty change by the Spirit of the Lord omnipotent, they had no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually. Of his own conversion, President Joseph F. Smith said, The feeling that came upon me was that of pure peace, of love, and of light. I felt in my soul that if I had sinned, and surely I was not without sin, that it had been forgiven me, that I was indeed cleansed from my sin. My heart was touched, and I felt I would not injure the smallest insect beneath my feet. I felt as if I wanted to do good everywhere, to everybody, and to everything. I felt a newness of life, a newness of desire to do that which was right. There was not one particle of desire for evil left in my soul. End of quote. Chapter 19, verse 34, they had seen angels, man. Angels have a significant mission. They preach the gospel. They bear witness of Christ and his gospel to the chosen vessels, that the chosen vessels may then bear witness to the residue of the people. Let's now turn to Alma, chapter 20. Chapter 20, verse 2, the phrase, But thou shalt go to the land of Madoni. The voice of the Lord directs Alma not to go to the land of Nephi, as Lamoni had requested, for Lamoni's father would seek his life. Rather, he was to go to the land of Madoni to seek, and to, the, to seek the deliverance of his brethren Aaron and Mulekai and Amma, who were in prison. We note with interest that the revelation advises him of the predicament of his brethren and charges him to rectify this situation, yet it gives no suggestion as how that might be accomplished. Nevertheless, Ammon proceeds without question or doubts on what would appear to be a daunting task. Well might he have said, as Nephi before him, I was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which I should do. Chapter 20, verse 4, the phrase, In the strength of the Lord thou canst do all things. As the Apostle Paul declared, If God be for us, who can be against us? How singular it is that Lamoni, who a few days before thought Ammon to be more than a man, now realizes that his strength rests in the God of heaven. We are reminded the admonition given to the youthful prophet Joseph Smith, For although a man may have many revelations and have power to do many mighty works, Yet if he boasts in his own strength and sets at naught the counsel of God and follows at the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. D.N.C. 3 verse 4. Chapter 20 verse 15, the phrase, I will not slay Ammon. Lamoni's refusal to obey his father's command was a definite no. His determination not to kill his best friend reveals to our senses the real change that has come in Lamoni's heart. He was willing to incur his father's wrath to protect the innocent. Before Ammon's visit, Lamoni exhibited all those qualities which mark the savage breast of which fix a life without God. He was proud and haughty, cruel and overbearing, superstitious and irrational. His word was law, but now he was gentle and cons considerate, firm in keeping the commandments of God, prostrating, prostrating himself on the ground, as did also the queen, showing the lowliness of his, their hearts. To prostrate oneself before majesty on high is in itself a recognition of God's greatness and the nothingness of man. Chapter 20, verse 17, the phrase, Thy soul could not be saved. 
and the statement implies that the king would have been guilty of murder. Joseph Smith taught that one guilty of murder, one that sheds innocent blood, cannot have forgiveness. Such a one would be guilty of the unforgivable sin, one for which the atonement of Christ cannot bring remission of sins. You see that in teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 339. Chapter 20, verse 18, the phrase, His blood would cry from the ground for vengeance, meant, In holy writ, blood is often used to represent life or the soul of man. See Leviticus 17.11 The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground, the Lord told Cain. Similarly, the cry of the blood of the saints shall ascend up to God from the ground against those who slew them. Indeed, their souls implore the Lord of Savaot, the Lord of hosts, to avenge their blood. The promise is that the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her shame. Chapter 20, verses 20 through 26 through 27, the phrase, He was astonished exceedingly. As selfless service created the opportunity for Ammon to teach the gospel to, Lo to Lamoni, so Ammon's selfless concern for Lamoni and for his own brethren without any interest in earthly honors or wealth, now creates the opportunity for him and his brethren to teach the gospel to Lamoni's father. Alman was a powerful preacher of righteousness, whose example of love and commitment spoke with effect and eloquence equal to that of his words. In full expectancy of death, the king awaited Ammon's blow, but it did not come. He thought the Nephite seducer of his son would seize upon this opportunity to repay in kind the abuse he himself had heaped upon Lamoni's companion. But when the king saw that Ammon did not desire to destroy him, he rejoiced in his magnanimity. Lamoni's father now began to see the true being of the hated Nephite. He wondered at Alman's loftiness of spirit and enabled him to bear the wrongs he and the king had inflicted. Ammon, he saw, disdained revenge, and under the most distressing circumstances had made sacrifices to attain worthy ends. Those ends astonished the king, but not so much as did the Nephite himself. The king was not used to such generosity as it exhibited by Ammon. His manly love for the Lamoni filled the king's heart with joy. Amma saw only the good of the king's son and the welfare of his own brethren. Chapter 20, verse 29, the phrase, they were patient in all their sufferings. The sons of Mosiah and their missionary brethren had their hearts riveted on the things of God's kingdom. They loved truth and righteousness more than their own lives. Perspective breeds and perpetuates patience. Because they could see and feel the things of, from God's point of view, they were willing to wait upon the promises of the Lord with all patience and faith. Hence, brothers and sisters, the need for us to see as God sees, so that we can have patience in God and not charge Him foolishly and become offended. Chapter 20, verse 30, the phrase, a more hardened and a more stiff-necked people. The record states that Aaron and his companions served among those who are more hardened and more stiff-necked people. Their experience parallels the experience of many who try to teach those who either have no interest in or who are antagonistic towards the gospel. President Henry B. Eyring explained why we must still try to teach every soul. Quote, why should I speak to anyone about the gospel who seems content? What danger is there to them or to me if I do not say if I do or say nothing? Well, the danger may be hard to see, but it is real, both for them and for us. For instance, at some moment in the world to come, everyone you will ever meet will know what you know now. They will know that only the only way to live forever in association with our families in the presence of Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, was to choose to enter into the gate by the baptism at the hands of those with authority from God. They will know that the only way families can be together forever is to keep and accept sacred confidence offered in the temples of God on this earth. And they will know what you know, and they will remember what you offered them, what, what someone had offered you. End of quote. Let's now turn to Alma, chapter 21. 21, verse 2, Amalekites. A sect of 
Nephite apostates, the greater part of whom were after the order of Nehor. They afflicted themselves with the they affiliated themselves with the Lamanites and aided in the building of the Lamanite city, Jerusalem. As is often the case with apostates, they possessed an unmeasured hatred for that which they had betrayed. Again and again we see those who leave the church who can never really leave the faith alone. The Lamanite generals placed those of their number in command positions in their armies because of their intense hatred of their former brethren and because of their more wicked and murderous disposition. Chapter 21, verse 2, the people of Amulon. Amulon was one of the most prominent and degraded priests of King Noah. He undoubtedly aided in the martyrdom of Abinadi. When King Noah was burned to death by his enraged subjects, Amulon with his fellow priests fled into the wilderness. There they hid themselves for an extended period, eventually capturing some Lamanite maidens and taking them to wife. The children they had deserted displeased with their father's conduct, later renounced that parentage and took upon themselves the name of Nephi. Meanwhile, the former priests commenced to cultivate what they called the land of Amulon. When discovered by the Lamanites with the, the wives they had kidnapped, they pleaded for mercy and were spared. Amulon and his group then joined the Lamanites, and soon after that, the Lamanite king made Amulon the ruler over the lands of Amulon and Helam. It was by virtue of this appointment that Amulon and his group became overseers of the people of Alma, who were eventually freed from their brutality by the providence of God. These former priests instructed the Lamanites in the learning of the Nephites. Thus the Amulonites were Nephites on their father's side and Lamanites on their mother's. Their education was that of the Nephites, and many of them became the followers of Nehor. Scattered throughout the lands of Amulon, Helam, and Jerusalem, they assumed a leading role as opponents of Ammon and his missionary brethren. None of their number repented and accepted the gospel. Rather, they became leaders in the persecution carried on against the suffering people of anti-Nephi-Lehi and with the Amalekites, made martyrs of many of those saints. Chapter 21, verse 3. The phrase, they did cause the Lamanites, they should harden their hearts, that they should wax strong in their wickedness and their abominations. The masters of wickedness are frequently those who have once known the path of virtue and truth and then have turned against them. As the Lamanites placed Amalekites and Zoramites at the head of their armies because of their un unmatched hatred against the Nephites, so the prince of darkness, Satan, places at the head of his legions to war against the church and the kingdom of God on earth those who have once known the purity of gospel truths. It is the apostates that Satan will use the most to attack God's true church. 21 verse 4, the phrase synagogues after the order of the Nehors meant, it is interesting that the man will worship something, whether it is true and living, God or the gods of men. The Amalekites and Ammonites had not eschewed all religion, but rather had embraced one that justified their iniquities and fed their hatred and wrath for those who preached the doctrine of Christ. It was held in the order of Nehor that all ought to have the right to do as they please. If what they please, that which was ple that which pleased those of the persuasion of Nehor. Chapter 21, verse 5, the phrase, There arose an Am Amalekite and to contend with him. A custom probably inherited by the Book of Mormon peoples throughout their Jewish ancestry was that a hearer of his words could interrupt the speaker with questions, usually that concerned the matter being discussed. Often Jesus wrote of his apostles experienced the same general accepted convention. It was a usual course of action among the Jews to propound, propound questions. When Jesus preached to the great multitude that falls into Capernaum and the Jews that surrounded him, plied the Savior with questions concerning his lineage. The method of question and answer brought forth many truths that otherwise might have been passed over without complete justification from the Savior's answer, which in themselves were sermons, we obtained the understanding of God's pur purposes, which in the orderly procedure of question and answers were clearly unfolded by him. Chapter 21, verse 5. Why do not angels appear unto us? 
In harmony with the order of heaven, angels appear unto just and holy men. The Savior's teachings, as recorded in Luke 16, 29-31, is relevant here. Clearly, those who will not hear the word of God as preached by one such as Aaron will not hear it if preached by one who's come back from the dead. The issue is the message, not the messenger. Chapter 21, verse 6, the phrase, God will save all men. Such was the doctrine espoused by Lucifer in the Grand Council of Heaven and popularized by Nehor among the descendants of Lehi. We are left to wonder why the Malachi... Malachites and the Amulonites thought it necessary to build synagogues and sanctuaries and assemble to worship in them when salvation, according to their theology, was easily obtained without their doing so. We note with interest that false religious ideologies that hold that ritual and form are unnecessary and are, as a general rule, meticulous about the form of godliness. It is also our experience that those ideologies that pride themselves in their ec ec ecumenical attitude and open-mindedness are the first, first to close ranks in anger, wrath against the true servants of the Lord and the message of salvation. Chapter 1 and verse 8, the phrase, We do not believe that thou knowest of, the, of things to come. As we shall soon see with Korhor the Antichrist, those who oppose the truth and fight the Lord and his servants often falsely and absurdly generalize beyond their own experience. Because they do not know, they assume no one else know, no one, no one else does. Because they are past feeling, they presume that no one else can and does feel. It is thus characteristic of false religion to deny the principle of revelation, to demand a closed cabin and heavens that are sealed. It is equally characteristic for them to refuse to see, to hear, to feel, or taste the things of the spirit. They are aptly described as being spiritually dead. If they believe that no one can know of things to come, how do they know that all will be saved? Is that not knowing of things to come? So false religions often are very self-contradictory, as these of the Nihor were contradictory. They claim that you cannot know of things to come. So how would they know that you could not be saved in the future if you cannot know of things to come? Chapter 21, verse 10, the phrase, They were angry with him. The wicked take the truth to be hard. They are angry with words of truth and righteousness. Chapter 21, verse 22, the phrase liberty of worshiping. It is characteristic of true religion to grant liberty of worship to all. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. We now turn to our final chapter, Alma, chapter 22. Chapter 22, 1, the phrase he, Aaron, was led by the Spirit to the land of Nephor, Nephi. The Lord has a plan, a scheme, a system. For the presentation of the gospel and the salvation of his sons and daughters. Those who seek to be in tune with the infinite have the glorious privilege of participating in that plan, of being a vital part in the blessing of mankind. One day we shall see how very much the Lord was involved in the affairs of the people on this earth, how masterfully and marvelously he has orchestrated the doings and feelings of his children in order to bring about the greatest blessings to the greatest number. Won't that be a great revelation to finally see? Chapter 22, verse 7. The phrase, If now the, thou sayest there is a God, behold, I will believe. The father of Lamoni here is here being born again to see the kingdom of God. He feels the spirit is touched and moved by its influence and now comes to trust in and believe the words of the Nephite spokesman. 28, 22 verse 8, the phrase, O king, there is a God. These are touching and tender words. They are the testimony of one of the great missionaries in the history of the world. Aaron knows. He knows. He does not just hope there is a God, nor does he derive his witness from physical evidence, though many at that point towards the reasonableness of a belief in a God. He knows because he has seen and felt and heard. He has experienced the Spirit of the Lord and can therefore speak with power and authority from God. Chapter 22, verses 10 through 14. 
The account of the conversion of Lamoni's father at the hands of Aaron is virtually a repeat of the story of Ammon's teaching and converting Lamoni. He first testifies that the Great Spirit is God, the creator of all things, both in heaven and on earth. He reads from the scriptures the account of Adam's creation in the image and likeness of God and explains how the earth and all things upon it became corruptible or mortal by virtue of Adam's fall. Death and the grave would have ruled supreme, save a plan of redemption had been provided, a plan which gave the sure promise that God's own Son would take upon himself mortal flesh, and that through his suffering and death he would atone for Adam's fall. Christ's atoning sacrifice would break the bands of physical death and create and grant mankind the hope of eternal glory if they would take upon themselves the sacred name of their Redeemer. 22 verse 12, the phrase reading the scriptures. Aaron, and we would assume the other Nephite missionaries, had copies of the scriptures, which were used for the teaching of the gospel. Chapter 22 verse 14, the phrase, since man have fallen, he could not merit anything of himself meant. Hearing is one of the greatest messages in all eternity, but one that unfortunately is little understood, even by many who are of the household of faith. We will not be saved in the highest heaven because we earn our way there. We will not be crowned with glory and eternal lives because we worked out our salvation by ourselves. It is as heretical to believe that we are exalted by works as it is to teach that we are saved by grace alone. As important as our works are in evidencing our acceptance of and commitment to Christ the Lord, works such as receiving the ordinance of salvation, performing deeds of kindness and acts of Christian charity, and enduring faithfully to the end, our works will not and cannot save us. It is impossible for any human being to do enough good deeds in this mortal sphere to qualify for life in the celestial kingdom. No, ultimately, we are saved not by works, but by his, not by our works, but by his works, the Lord's. Wherefore, Lehi said to his son Jacob, I know that thou art redeemed because of the righteousness of thy Redeemer. That is to say, before the Father, the Lord Jesus intercedes for us on the back by basis of his works, that means Jesus' works. Listen to him who is the advocate with the Father, the Savior urges in a modern revelation, who is pleading your cause before him, saying, Father, behold the sufferings and death of him who did no sin, and whom thou wast well pleased. Behold the blood of thy Son which was shed, the blood of him who thou gavest, that thou thyself might be glorified. What an unusual defense, what an unnatural scene, what a glorious message. The mediator pleads our cause on the basis of his work, his atonement. What then is our role? Wherefore, Father, he continues, spare these my brethren that believe on my name, that they may come unto me and have everlasting life. That's our role, to believe on the name of Christ and endure to the end in that belief and faith in that name and in the authority of Jesus Christ. Truly, there is a power in Christ, power not only to create worlds and divide seas, but also to still the storms of the human heart, to heal the pain of scarred and beaten souls. We must learn to trust in him more in the arm of flesh less. We must learn to rely on him more and on man-made solutions less. We must learn to surrender our burdens to him more. We must learn and work to our limits and then be willing to seek that grace or enabling power which make up the difference, that sacred power which indeed makes all the difference. Truly, Nephi taught this priceless and precious message when he reminded us that it is by grace that we are saved after all that we can do. After, meaning not following or subsequent to, but rather above and beyond. After all we can do, it will be finally by the condescension and mercy and grace of the Holy One of Israel that we become like him, vessels fit to live with him, who brought us up with his blood. Brothers and sisters, there is no power in any of the programs of this church. I don't care how many times you go to the temple, how many times you repent, how many missions you serve. 
None of that has saving power. The saving power is in the grace of Jesus Christ. We do all of the other things to show our faith in Christ. That's what those other things are for. For us a way to show our faith in him. And then that faith gives us access to Christ's grace. That then enables us to become like him. 22 verse 15, the phrase, What shall I do that I may have eternal life? From Adam's day to ours, and from ours to the time that when the last of the human family draws a breath on this mortal sphere, this is the grand question of all existence. What must we do to obtain eternal life? Such was the question addressed by the rich young ruler to the master. Keep the commandments was the Savior's answer. Which came the rejoinder. Which came the rejoinder. Christ reviewed the Ten Commandments of Sinai. The younger man said unto him, All these things I have kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell what thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come follow after me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So when he says, What lack I yet? He lacked faith in Christ in all things. We are left to suppose that the inquiring rich man had assumed he would receive direction to conform to some ritualistic requirement of the mosaic system. He did not understand that the Lord requires the whole soul and that those who gain salvation do so by their willingness to lay down all their energy, talents, and means upon the altar of God. How much more perfect the desires of Lomoni's father, whose power and fortune would undoubtedly have far exceeded his old world counterpart. I will give up all that I possess, he said. Yea, I will forsake my kingdom that I may receive this great joy. Such is the pattern. We obtain the kingdom of, he of heaven by forsaking the kingdoms of this earth. We must be willing to sacrifice all for Jesus Christ, we have power to be saved by the grace of Christ. 22 verse 16, the phrase, bow down before God. How often had the king's servants bowed before him in expression of respect and honor. Now it is for the king to acknowledge that same homage to another king, one infinitely greater than himself. The phrase, the hope which thou desirest, meant the hope of eternal life is born of faith and repentance. It matters not whether we be rich or poor, educated or ignorant, old or young. The system of salvation is the same for all people in all ages. That hope begins by pulling the weeds of sin, that the seeds of faith may be planted and have room to grow. Chapter 22, verse 18, the phrase, I will give away all my sins to know thee. Like Lamoni's father, we must be willing to sacrifice all things to be born of God. In the lectures on faith, Joseph Smith taught, we learn the importance of sacrifice in our eternal progression. Quote, Let us here observe that a religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things never has power sufficient to produce the faith necessary unto life and salvation. For from the first existence of man, the faith necessary unto the enjoyment of life and salvation never could be obtained without the sacrifice of all earthly things. It was through this sacrifice and this only that God has ordained that man should enjoy eternal life. And it is through the medium of the sacrifice of all earthly things that men do actually know that they are doing the things that are well-pleasing in the sight of God. When a man has offered in sacrifice all that he has for the truth's sake, not even withholding his life, and believing before God that he has been called to make this sacrifice because he seeks to do his will, he does know most assuredly that God does and will accept his sacrifice and offering, and that he has not, nor will not seek his face in vain. Under these circumstances, then, he can obtain the faith necessary for him to lay hold on eternal life. The willingness to sacrifice all earthly things is another way of saying that we are willing to submit completely our will to the will of the Father. Only then, when we com completely submit everything, our will, our agency, and turn everything over to the will of the Father, then we will have the faith necessary to obtain 
hold of eternal life. While serving in the 70, Alexander B. Morrison taught concerning the sacrifices we must make to come unto Christ. Quote, to take his name upon us means a willingness to do whatever he requires of us. Someone has said that the price of a Christian life is the same today as always. It is simply to give all that we have, holding back nothing, to give away all our sins to know him. When we fall short of that standard by reason of sloth, indifference, or wickedness, when we are evil or envious, selfish, sensual, or shallow, we, in a sense at least, crucify him, Christ, afresh. And when we try con con consistently to do our very best, when we care for and serve others, when we overcome selfishness with love, when we place the welfare of others above our own, when we bear each other's burdens and mourn with those that mourn, when we comfort those that stand in need of comfort and stand as witness of God at all times and in all things and in all places, then we honor him and draw from his power and become more and more like him, growing brighter and brighter if we persist until the perfect day. End of quote. Chapter 22, verse 18, the phrase, be saved at the last day. The notion that one can be saved by the expression of belief in the midst of one's mortal probation vulgarizes all other prince gospel principles. It negates the need for repentance, suspends the necessity of the ordinance of salvation, denies the principles of advancement from grace to grace, excuses the need for continued gospel study, and shields us from the sanctifying influence of righteous works. The voice of the Lord may speak, rendering the promise that one's calling election is sure, but even then the promise is contingent upon continued righteousness and faithful service in the Lord's vineyard. True it is, as herein stated, that one is saved only at the last day. We must endure to the end. Chapter 22, verse 23, the phrase, the king stood forth and began to minister to them. Rejoicing in the knowledge that he has obtained, the king administered those same principles to his household. Those people, too, are converted. It is characteristic of those who are truly converted to seek to share the fruits of the tree of life with family and other loved ones. Chapter 22, verse 26, the praise preached the word. The power of conversion is in the word. It is in the preaching of the, go of the gospel of the kingdom. Such was the example of the Savior, and such is the witness of virtually all Scripture. Too often those called to preach the word choose instead to be spiritual cheerleaders or to moralize on ethical principles. As well intended as such efforts may be, they lack the power of conversion. Chapter 22, verses 20, 27 through 34, the phrase, The king sent a proclamation throughout the land. In these verses, many find what they consider to be the key to the Book of Mormon geography. However, this passage was written to furnish important information concerning missionary travels of the elders and priests, and also to indicate the vast extent of territory over which the Nephites and Lamanites have spread. From the limited information they give, a number of maps have been prepared. No two seem to agree, but from the beginning of our prayerful studies of the Book of Mormon, when the Beatitudes of the Sacred Records first become known to us, we have counseled against map making. We believe that any attempt to point, pinpoint the locale of Book of Mormon cities and lands is guesswork and represents only the opinions of the map makers themselves. Such a course, we believe, is fraught with peril both to the narrative and to the teachings therein contained. Time has not changed our conclusions. The trouble in map making an unfamiliar area is that the amateur cartographer seeks to employ in his survey any and all points that he imagines will favor his particular notion, no matter how honestly intended. He consciously or unconsciously rests the finely translated passages to substantiate a certain thesis. Thus, in presenting his conjectures, he gives a deceptive appearance to some plausible but nevertheless unprovable theory. In the exploits of many novice map makers, this procedure has proved to be the case. 
Then, too, there are many of our readers who permit others to do their thinking. They need to remember that it is easy to present an unreal and misleading inference and then to palm it off as reasoned judgment. The Book of Mormon is not a geography. The writers of the sacred record gave little space or much effort to describe the physical features of the region wherein took place the events they recorded. It is not a record of borders and boundary lines, of rivers, of highways, of areas of population and industry. But as it is repeatedly shown, the Book of Mormon is a book of doctrine intended to convince the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. But the modern but the modern day attempts that are constantly being made to identify the cities and lands of the Book of Mormon with the old and obscured ruins found in Mexico and parts further south will end in failure. This is the opinion of many reliable scholars who have made it an object of search and research. Certainly such attempts will produce little good. It is folly to associate oneself with any particular notion and say of some particular ruin that this is the city of Zarahemla or that this is the land bountiful. Such ventures and thoughts are merely guess and such speculation leads to confusion. There is a way the students of the Book of Mormon may avoid the distractions and pitfalls caused by mixed-up theories and selfish opinions of geography that is, sh that is to shun all speculation. It does not matter one iota where Lehi landed near the 30th degree of south latitude where the prophet Joseph Smith is alleged to have said that he did or somewhere in Central America where others speculate his landing. What does matter, however, is whether or not we obey the voice of God's Nephite servants, the doctrines they proclaim, the path to which they point, and the sureness of the way reveal a vivid picture of our Father's plan of salvation. Two, they have a permanent authority about them that they all may recognize who desire to know his holy mind and will. These doctrines are meat and drink to the soul and the mysteries surrounding the Nephite geography can wait until the day when what we know not now we will know hereafter. There is enough to establish beyond any doubt the hope in Christ which the Nephite prophets proclaimed. We can leave the solution of the geography geographic mysteries to him whose wisdom we cannot fathom. We can lean upon omnipotence we cannot grasp. In this connection, a statement made in 1890 by Elder George Q. Cannon of the First Presidency said will be sufficient, quote, there is a tendency strong manifested at the present time among of the brethren to study the geography of the Book of Mormon. We have heard of numerous lectures illustrated by suggestive maps being delivered on this subject during the present winter, generally under the auspicious of the improvement societies and Sunday schools. We are greatly pleased to notice the increasing interest taken by the saints in this holy book. It contains the fullness of the gospel of Christ, and those who prayerfully study its sacred pages can be made wise unto salvation. It also unravels many mysteries concerning with the history of the ancient world, more particularly this western continent, mysteries which no other book explains. But valuable as is the Book of Mormon, both in doctrine and history, yet it is possible to put this sacred bottle into uses for which it was never intended, uses which are detrimental rather than advantages to the cause and truth, and consequently to the work of God. What were the uses that this book was never meant to be used for? He continues, We have been led to these thoughts from the fact that the brethren who lecture on the lands of the Nephites or the geography of the Book of Mormon are not united in their conclusions. No two of them so far have learned or agreed on all points, and in many cases the variations amount to thousands of miles. These differences of views lead to discussions, contention, and perplexity, and we believe more confusion is caused by these divergencies than good is done by the truths elicited. Brothers and sisters, the Book of Mormon was never meant to be a book of geography. 
It was never meant to teach. And those who spend their lives studying the Joffrey and trying to pinpoint are wasting their time at the expense of valuable doctrine, valuable gospel doctrine that they just pass over and do not learn and do not incorporate in their lives. Let's stop off the foolishness of arguing over of what took place where on which continent. That does not matter. That Jesus is the Christ and the only name under heaven which we can be saved. That is what matters. Continuing with George Q. Cannon. How is it that there is such a variety of ideas on this subject? Simply because the Book of Mormon is not a geographical primer. It was not written to teach geographical truths, so let's not do it. What is told us to the situation of various lands or cities of the ancient Jaredites, Nephites, and Lamanites is usually simply an incidental remark connected with the doctrinal or historical portions of the work, and almost invariably only extends to a statement of the relative position of some land or city to contiguous or surrounding places, and nowhere gives us the exact situation or boundaries so that it can be definitely located without fear of error. It must be remembered that geography as a science like chronology and other branches of education was not understood or taught after the manner or by the methods of the moderns. It could, it could not be amongst these people who were not acquainted with the size and form of the earth, as was the case with most of the nations of antiquity, though not with the Nephites. Their seers and prophets appear to have received divine light on this subject. The first presidency have often been asked to prepare some suggestive map illustrative of Nephite geography, but have never consented to do so. Well, we should take our 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 life plan from that. If the first presidency do not do anything with it, then we should leave it alone. Continuing. Brother Cannon, nor are we acquainted with any of the twelve who would undertake such a task. The reason is that without further information, they are not prepared even to suggest. The word of the Lord or the translation of other ancient records is required to clear up many points, now so obscured that, as we have said, no two original investigators agree with regard to them. When, as is the case, one student places a certain city at the Isthmus of Panama, a second in Venezuela, a third in Guyana, or northern Brazil, it is obvious that suggestive maps prepared by these brethren would confuse instead of enlighten, and they cannot be thus far apart in this one important point without relative positions also being also widely separate. For these reasons, we have strongly strong objections to the introduction of maps and their circulation among our people, which profess to have the location of Nephite cities and settlements. As we have said, they have a tendency to mislead instead of enlighten, and they give rise to discussion which will lead to division of sediment and be very unprofitable. We, saw no, we see no necessity for maps of this character, because at least much would be left to the imagination of those who prepared them, and we hope that there will be no attempt made to introduce them or give them general circulation. Of course, there can be no harm result from the study of geography of this continent at the time it was settled by the Nephites, drawing all the information possible from the record which has been translated for our benefit. But beyond this, we do not think it necessary at the present time to go, because it is plain to see we think that evil may result therefrom. That was from a member of the First Presidency, or in other words, those are the words of Jesus Christ. Let's knock off the study, the useless waste of time study of the geography of the Book of Mormon. Even if you could know exactly the locations and pinpoint, that would make not one iota difference to our salvation. That knowledge does not save us, so who cares where it was done? It's just mere curiosity. Brothers and sisters, let's focus on the doctrine of the Book of Mormon. Knock off these maps and arguing over a heartland theory or a Mesoamerican theory or whatever theory is out there. Let's stop the contention of it. Because that is of the devil. He would love us to constantly argue with each other over it and spend our time studying it. And then we never learn the doctrine of Christ. And then we never come unto him. 
That is one way Satan will keep us. He'll keep us busy with trivial, stupid things. Let's not do it. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.